So welcome back friends to part three of the top 50 tools that every man needs. Man is getting down to the wire now. It's getting difficult. I'm starting to lose sleep worrying about these last three videos. The first, first view we had some room to, uh, to, to play with, but now I really got to get down to hard decisions. But um, I think we're on the right track. So the, pr the previous two videos, if you're interested in that, uh, I'll put a link to those at the end of this one. And we're gonna be covering number 21 through 30. Is that right? 20 through 30? Whatever. The third set. All right. Number 21. Extension cords. You got to have extension cords. Now, there's going to be a couple options with these. And of course, if you go to Home Depot or your box store, you're going to see all different types of uh, lengths, sizes. They're going to be anywhere from 10, 25, um, 50s, and 100s, and different thicknesses. And it's, sometimes it's really tempting to buy uh, the inexpensive cords that are, that are a smaller diameter, um, but that comes at a price. Uh, you are, it's going to be harder on your tools if you're starving them for power. It's not good for the motors. So if you're running you know, big saws, skill saws, if you're running tools that are, you're putting a lot of load on, you might want to think about sizing up those cords a little bit. Now, there's, you're going to see the three. You're going to see the great big heavy contractor versions. You're going to see something kind of in between. And I should have looked at the, these at the gauge. I like this gauge. What is it? 12. Is it 12 AWG? That's my favorite. 3.31 millimeters or 12 AWG. I like this size here. Uh, I'm not a contractor anymore. I'm not running tons of tools. Uh, so it's a kind of a good price point. You don't really need those super fat thick ones. They're twice the price. They're really expensive. What you're looking for, you want 50s. Only buy 50s. Don't buy those 100 footers uh, for just a common guy. They're just too much hassle. They're heavy. They take forever to roll up. They're really prone to tangling. They're just too much. If you need that, buy 250s. I'll always buy 250s over 100 if I have the option. They're just so much more manageable. Now, if you're going to have a cord that's going to be inside of a wood shop or you just have a small garage and you don't plan on stringing stuff out all over the yard, get a 25. Get a 25 and that's the best way to go. I would recommend that you get the ones with the light with the light at the end. Man, it's aggravating not knowing, you know, you pull, pull the switch and the trigger doesn't work. Is it my tool or is it the cord? If you have the light in the, at the end of the receptacle, you can quickly tell, oh, I've got power to this. It just, it makes life a lot easier. One thing you might want to consider, and then I'll, that I hadn't really brought up also is, well, this is a tough call. The 25, this is a 25 shop cord, and this has the triple end on it. It's not lit, but it has the triple end, and that's really, really convenient as well, especially if you're, let's say you're, at your, in your shop and you're running a skill saw and you're running a jigsaw, and that back and forth, back and forth, uh, plug, you know, is kind of a hassle. The problem I have with these guys is they catch on everything. Whenever you're pulling it or you're trying to wrap up or finish the day, this thing will hang up. My uncle or a cousin had a cousin that was a contractor. I think he did roofing. He said, boy, if you're ever, ever falling off a roof, just, just grab a hold of an extension cord because that sucker will hang on to something. <laughs> it's so true. So true. So uh, 25 for the shop. Uh, so here's the better option. Do I have my splitter? Yes. Man, I'm not very prepared for today's video. Goodness, look at this. All right, so what I would think is better than this uh, is kind of what the contractors do is get yourself a 25 and then get a three-way. This is a three-way that you can plug in when you need it and you don't have to have it attached all the time. So I'm gonna recommend 250s and that 12 AWG, whatever gauge that is with the lit end and get yourself a three-way. This is not counting as an extra tool. I can't, I can't give it up. So that's a one. So that's extension cord, extension cord 101 there for you. All right, what's next? Uh, we're gonna do our power tool today. Every time we should have a power tool. Oh, what is this? The saw, what do they claim? The saw that built America. The saw that built America, the Mag 77 skill saw, the worm drive. Man, oh man, talk about a versatile saw. My dad always said that you could build an entire house with this tool if you had nothing else. And he's right. It can replace a table saw. It can cut sheet goods. 
it can cut, uh, you can put a fiber blade on it, you can cut steel with it, you can put a diamond blade on it, you can cut concrete, you can cut ceramic, you can cut marble. We even used to take the carbide blades and turn them around backwards. This is not a very fun process, very noisy, very dangerous, and cut uh, sheet metal for, or roofing, metal roofing. What you can do with this thing is incredible. Very well built, they're, they're tough, they've been around forever. This is something that you can usually find used for pretty good prices at garage sales, but the new ones are not that expensive either. So you have a couple choices. There's gonna be a standard one that's just your regular uh, skill saw worm drive, and then you, they have an option that's a Mag 77, and that's this one. It has a magnesium frame, and it's lighter. So if it's something you're gonna be using a lot, if you have in your future uh, that you're gonna build your own house uh, or you're gonna build an add-on or remodel, I'd probably step up to the Mag 77 and get yourself a couple blades. Get, uh, get an all-purpose kind of a combination blade that'll just be for rough framing. And then you get your a blade that's got a high tooth count so you could cut nice stuff. Let's say you're gonna, going to do um, cut some veneer plywood or you just have something that you want to finish off nicely, uh, you can do a lot with this. You can install a ripping guide on the side. You can get really accurate cuts. I mean, it is, it is the go-to saw. It is very, very robust, very, very versatile, super powerful, and you can just do everything with it. If I was only going to have one saw, this is the one that I would take, even over a table saw, because it's just more versatile, not as convenient, but more versatile. So the Mag 77 skill saw, and you don't have to go with the, with the skill brand. I'm not just promoting that. I, I seem to prefer it. I have three of them. I have a Makita, which I don't like. I have a, um, it's a, a worm drive version of this. I have a, I used to have a Milwaukee. I didn't like that either. I prefer this. I have three of these, I think, two or three of these and uh, love them. So that is, that's the saw you want right there. Okay, what's next? What is next? Oh, it's, comes, it's coming down to these tough choices here. Uh, guys, you're gonna wanna have a level. Now, can you just have one? Can you get by with one level? If you're not going to be building, if you're not gonna be building a house or standing up walls or anything like that, then just go and get yourself a level like this, uh, and the Empire levels at Home Depot are, are fine. You want a two-footer. If for just general purpose, I'm not Joe Contractor, I'm not doing a lot of framing, things like that, you can get by with it. You can use it for, uh, if you're putting plumbing in, you know, you're figuring fall, you can use it for leveling pictures, you can level, use it for many, many different things. And you can kind of expand that a little bit if you get a really, really straight piece of board, like an MDF, something that's, that's factory cut, you can attach the level to it. Um, and you can extend that. You can, you know, maybe take a, a four foot board MDF and get away with it. I, I've done that before. You can do walls and stuff. So if you're just going to have one, the 24 incher. Now, if you think you're going to be building and doing more stuff, you need to get a four footer. The four footer is more accurate. It picks up more of the, let's say the stud, if you're doing walls or, or concrete forms or whatever, it's just kind of the standard. This is the minimum that you would want for building. Framing contractors, they have sixes, and I think some of them even have eight footers. Uh, well, maybe, maybe they're just six footers. So if you do decide to have a four footer, problem with this is it's no good for small areas. So if you're doing uh, blocking inside of a wall or you're in a tight confined area, you're gonna have to mix that in with a smaller one. So something like this, this is a, that's an empire as well. Uh, or a torpedo level, you see the little ones, make sure it's got magnetic, the magnetic bottom on it. That's very handy uh, because it'll stick to metal things. Um, it just seems real handy if you do any sort of metal work. I, I'd probably just get that. There's really no downside. So if you're just going to have one, not Joe Contractor, the 24-incher, spirit level, and if you're going to do heavy construction, you got to have two. I'm going to count this all as one because I can, it's my video, uh, a four footer and a, a smaller 12 inch or torpedo type level. All right, what do we have next? This is a no brainer. You, many of you guys have recommended this one here, a crowbar. And again, <laughs> you can't have any, you can't have one, you really can't. Um, 
these, this is a package deal here. This is counting as one. Uh, it just has to. They're, they're so different and they're so necessary. I, I was worrying about this, like, oh, if I could only have one of these, which one would it be? Which one would it be? I'd take both. You can't. This would be number one, the flat bar, and then the, I don't know. No, I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. I just can't make that decision. Let's start with this. So this is the old school traditional one, kind of like the a shepherd's crook here. You know, nothing really fancy to it. These are a dime a dozen at used tool stores. They're not expensive new. You're going to go to Home Depot and you're going to see um, all different, different sorts of varieties and, you know, different twists on it. It doesn't really make that much difference. What you want is something with a bent end or sheep's foot type of thing there that you can really get leverage and pull nails. And then you've got just a standard pry bar with an angle on there. This is not just for carpentry work. This is not just for nails. This is for when things get bad. Uh, when you need to pry something off, when you, you, you can't get your brake drums off because of the road salt and they seized up, or you need to pound a pin, or you need to, whatever needs to, whatever big work, you need to pry a door open because there was a car wreck in front of your house. You know, if you don't have something like this, what are you going to do? Don't forget that a sawzall also cuts through glass. Uh, anyway, I'm digressing there. So a good crowbar like this, uh, just a standard garden variety, is a, is a must-have for many things. And the reason why, then there's this one. This is called, out west here we call these wonder bars, or I've heard them called flat bars. Can't live without it. This is going to be something that I, when I'm working in framing, this is in my tool belt. It's going to be used for, for lifting up plywood. If you're nailing stuff on the walls, it's going to be used, uh, especially when you're installing doors or you need to get behind something that's really thin and pry it that you want to save, like siding, uh, a bazillion different things. But this is the standard variety one. It's many tools in one. It's very thin. It's called a flat bar. There's a nail puller here. There's a nail puller there um, that works kind of. I never really use these for nail pulling. They're not super, super effective for that. Uh, this is a way better tool. But this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this a match pet set. So a standard big full-size crowbar and a flat or a wonder bar. Those are, got to have them. Just gotta, gotta have them. All right, uh, more tough decisions. A guy needs to have a way to find out what's going on with electrical stuff. Even if you are not an electrical engineer or, or have a great vast knowledge of that stuff, you just, you, you have to have it and you can't just have one. Well, I guess you could, I guess you could. You could, if I was just gonna have one, uh, a voltmeter, a good voltmeter like this. This is a fluke, um, decent quality, good quality voltmeter. This is going to, to you be able to test current. Uh, if you're going to work on your house and, and you want to know if the power is off, yeah, you can flip the breakers and all, all that. But you know, some if, for me, I, even when they're flipped off, I like to know. I just it makes me anxious working on electricity if I'm not 100% sure it's not live. And uh, as, as many, even our cars now, and as sophisticated as things are getting, it used to be you could get by, you know, this is what granddad had, you know? This is just a 12 volt tester. It's got an alligator clip on it. And uh, you put this on the ground and we used to dip it on, stick it on the key and poke around and, and check and see, am I getting power to stuff? I could check and see if the fuses are bad. If you're wiring trailers, if, you, if you're really low tech stuff, this is a great tool. This is what I grew up with using with him. With him and it was good enough. Everything was 12 volt, and the light came on and, and all of that, but not so much anymore. You know, now things have specific voltages that they require, and you could, I guess you could essentially hook this on and, and be reading a current, um, but if the voltage wasn't right, it not work. So, you know, I think technology has kind of outstripped this. It's a nice thing to have for crude stuff, but not, not super versatile uh, as this. You can do both with this. You can check uh, your amp 12 volt. You can check your, your 110. You can check everything you need to do. Your outlet power with this uh, um, is it, pretty versatile, pretty, pretty versatile. Am I going to use this? Am I going to be packing this around when I'm working on my, in my, my tool belt? No. I mean, we have these little tiny ones now that I can stick in an outlet that are you know, going to tell me, is it 240? Is it 120? Is it hot? Is it not? It's, it's got an audible alarm. It's a lot less clumsy to deal with. So yeah, it'd be nice to have all three, wouldn't it? I'll have to, you'll have to make the judge, the judgment call on that. So getting really specific, really getting into, and in, 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 I may, might be going too detailed here. 
uh, with this stuff. I, I'm talking about the common guy that he's not really intellectual, but you want to be safe. What would I choose? <sighs> I would probably have to choose the voltmeter. It's just so, so versatile and it takes a little bit of a learning curve. You're going to have to learn how to use it, but they're not overly complicated. So we'll just go with that. Well, as much as I hate to give these guys up, we're going to go with a, a good quality voltmeter like the Fluke multimeter, like the 77 there. Sorry to see you guys go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, next, you need a utility knife, a razor knife, uh, a knife that's going to run just, just your regular, we call them drywall knives out here. This uh, is an essential tool for, <laughs> for opening your Amazon boxes to cutting tar paper uh, for a roof, uh, from cutting drywall, a, a, cut, you know, a bazillion different things. You know, some people might say, well, you just need a knife. Um, yeah, of course you need a knife, but th this shape is, is just the best. You know, a little triangle, it comes to a point. You don't have to worry about sharpening it all the time. The blades are, are very inexpensive. You can carry, keep blades in the handle and you always have a sharp knife. So I, I don't, I can't, I, I don't agree with that, that, uh, for, for tools and, and a working guy that a regular knife can replace one of these. I don't think so. It makes a list. So the best one that I've found, I don't like Radley tools. You know, things that rattle around. I don't like things that roll around in the car. It bothers me. And I don't like, I like positive lockup on things. And what I found with a lot of those Stanley tool, Stanleys and all the different, there's a million different varieties of these things. Before you buy one, grab it and, and see if the blade wiggles. I just don't want that. I want solid lockup. These are the best. These Orcons, these are actually made for carpet cutters. And the first time I uh, saw one was a, with a carpet layer and I asked him about it and I found out where it was and I've bought them every since. And also the nice thing about the Orcons is they are toolless. So when you want to, I mean, when you want to change the blade on the Stanleys, a lot of those you have to whoa, have a screwdriver or a pair of pliers. I try to get that thing off there. Not these. This is just the perfect utility knife. It's got a little flip out, super quality, really nice these. A little flip out D ring on there that you can, uh, get to your blades. And this is the one you want, the Orcon. I mean, you're talking about a couple dollars difference. Um, you, ergonomic, great, no rattle. I love, I just love these knives. I got like three of them. Utility knife. You have to have a utility knife. You're going to have to have Allen wrenches and, you know, you could almost make the argument Torx wrenches as well. Um, it probably should be a combination, but if I had to choose between a Torx and the Allen, I th it, it just seems to be in my life, in my experience, that the Torx is le less common, less common than the Allens. The Allen wrenches are ubiqu, Allen screws are ubiquitous, and you have to have them. And then un unfortunately, in the United States, you're going to have to have a metric and a standard set. So they're going to, you know, a couple different options. You've seen, I don't have them right here. Should I grab them? Let me grab them. I resisted buying these for so long because they're kind of expensive and they're certainly not very portable, but I'll tell you what, I have loved these things. I broke down and I bought two sets of these Bondus, Bondus, USA made sets. I got a standard set and a metric set. The standard, of course, are the yellow and the metrics are the red. I love these. These are really high quality and they have great big handles, big T handles on them that you can really get some, some torque on and they're so convenient to use. Now they're convenient to use in a shop, but they're not very portable at all and they don't fit into any toolbox unless you want to have them loose and who wants to have them loose? I mean, that's just a nightmare. So if you're just working in a shop, I would highly, highly recommend these. They're a little bit of an investment, but they are absolutely the best Allen wrenches I've ever, ever worked with. So if port portability is your case in, is your deal and, and you don't really have a dedicated shop right now, just get a good set like this um, that are all nested in together. Now there's the ones that kind of fold up like the Swiss Army knife. Those are okay too. Um, a lot of those are kind of are really cheap. I mean, there are some good ones out there. They're a little bit harder to find. But I find that having them mated to the handle doesn't give you a lot of options if you need to use it because you want to use both sides. I mean, the reason why these are the way they are is so to get into different spots, tight spots and stuff. So you can run it this way or you can run it this way. And 
I'll tell you, these with the round, the round on the bottom, these, this is a set of snap-ons here, with the round are so wonderful when you have things with long threads because what it allows you to do is you can, uh, is gives you deflection. This, this tool will operate at an angle. So if you've got a screw and something's in your way and you can't get to it, sometimes you can come in there and you can turn that and get to it. Those little ball heads on there are, I would look for that. I would look for USA made uh, Allens and, and configuration just like this, metric and standard. Size wise, I think this is a great set. This is 3 eighths down to 0 0.050 or 16th of an inch. I don't know that I've ever used that teeny tiny one. I would say a 16th to 3 eighths or it would be even half would be a pretty respectable set. This here, the Bondus set, what's this go to? Yeah, 3 8 A 3 8 that's a big Allen. Yeah, we don't need to go up to half inch. You started getting into big industrial stuff there. We don't, we don't need that. 3 8 is a good size, but um, go with something like this. I'll see if I can find a, a non-snap-on version that's a little bit better price than these, but these are wonderful. Allen wrenches, you gotta have two sets. There's just no way around it. No way around it. All right, we got only two left. Channel locks, channel locks. I, uh, I have a dozen pair of these uh, in all different sizes. I've got the great big giant ones that I use all the time, especially if you're doing irrigation stuff. But if you're not doing really big monster stuff, um, a size like this is probably just about right. This is probably about an eight inch, what do they call these, an eight inch set. Uh, I'll put a link to the, my choices of these tools down in the subject heading of this video so you can check that out. Um, and I'll put the ones that I recommend on there. A channel lock brand, um, no problem with that. I've got Snap-on, I've got channel lock brand, uh, multiples and several of them, and I can't say that I've ever really noticed a difference apart from the fit and finish is a little bit nicer on the Snap-on. But a channel locks gives you the ability, it's the, it's, it's the next step above pliers. When, when pliers won't get it done, or pliers really won't grab onto stuff that's very big, uh, these will. I mean, they'll open up a long way um, and it gives you just so many options. <laughs> Remember, I had a, we had a metal shop teacher in high school. We had a really good metal shop and he was a brilliant machinist. And he came in, he was a really opinionated guy. He came in and he was so angry. He had watched uh, I don't know, was it 60 Minutes or what was that? What's that old guy that's always was always complaining about stuff? Rooney? Rooney? I think he did a segment talking about how useless channel locks were. And old Ramsey, our teacher, he was so mad. It's like, who's this guy think he is? He expects that, uh, you know, never having worked with tools, never having worked with his hands to grab a tool that he knows nothing about, that he doesn't have any practice with, and, and that he can put, place judgment on something that, is, that, that he knows nothing about. You know, does he, expect, <laughs> does he expect me to be able to sit down at a type, his typewriter that I've never sat at before and, and type 80, 90, 100 words a minute, you know, without practice? It takes practice to use tools like these. And just because you grab one and it didn't seem to be convenient or work for you doesn't mean that it's not a good tool. This is a must have. You have to have a channel lock. Um, cause look, look how big it is. You can get on stuff that's over an inch, inch and a quarter, uh, pipes, pipe nipples. Um, this, it's just stuff when, when you just run out of options, you oftentimes go to the channel locks. Channel locks are a must have. We're down to two. You need a good shovel. Need a good shovel, and I, you know, there's two ch we got two choices with shovels. We've got a spade, a digging shovel like this, and we have a flat point, which is more of a scraping shovel for for scraping up stuff, for shoveling snow and that sort of things, those sort of things. Uh, I almost, you know, made, almost said, okay, well, you have to have two shovels. You have to have a a square, and you have to have a spade. But I, I have that those, and to be honest with you, I, I just, I rarely use it. There's no question on which one would be more important. You want a good quality spade. Now, most of the shovels that are made uh, in a big box store are rubbish. Uh, they're just terrible. They are um, poorly designed. They're, they're much too bulbous and round. Um, they're good for carrying material in that they, they have a, a lot of surface area if you're just moving sawdust or bark dust or you're moving gravel, but they're not great for digging. Um, so you want something that has way more of a spade on it like this. This is a, a wildland firefighting t shovel and it's completely different than a normal shovel and you can look at it at the angle. 
and this is made for scraping and for moving material. If you're moving hot burning embers and things, it carries it really well. You can see kind of in the pocket, it's got a real pronounced, uh, it's a concave, uh, re re really a, a pronounced uh, radius there to hold that material in there. And some guys said they don't like digging with them because they, they, put, they come at a different angle. So to actually get it, if you're digging straight down, you know, the, the shovel handle has to be an extreme angle like this. I haven't found that to be a problem and I don't mind digging with it at all. I, 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 I won't grab one of those old ones, those other ones, the traditional shovel. I like these. They're, they're expensive, but this is a heritage tool here. This is one that's going to last you forever. These are all forged. They're made in USA. A lot of the good ones, oh, this one I think is made in Ireland. For some reason, Ireland makes, makes really nice fire shovels. Hard to find. I think Council Tools has them. I don't know if I'm going to be able to provide you a link for these. I will look. If I can, I will put it in there. Um, but if you can't find that, go to a landscaping store or a place where um, they sell pipe or excavator shop. People who use sh uh, shovels for a living and get a shovel there. Uh, they have... The, don't buy the don't buy the stuff that they have at the big box store. It's 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 just rubbish. R rubbish. Hammers. Oh man, remember I did a hammer video a while back, and what did I, I when I was trying to call them? What did I finally it's like? Okay, I only need to keep sixteen hammers or something like that. If you could only have one, it'd have to be a claw hammer, a framing hammer, and it would be a, an S wing. Uh, I don't like S-Wing per se to swing or work with for a long time. I would never recommend it for a full-time framer because of the steel is hard on the joints. The vibration that translates through the steel into your elbow gives you a, a sore elbow or a tennis elbow. Um, but for an all-arounder, they are tough as nails. You just can't break them. They're very affordable. Uh, they, they have got... S-Wing's got these hammers dialed. The, the handles don't fail. The rubber never gets bad. Whatever it is that they, they have put together a combination here that is just great, tough. You can use it for a demo tool. You can abuse it. It just, it just never going to let you down. It's never going to break on you. And if it does, it's going to have a warranty. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't buy a waffle head. Just buy a standard smooth head. And don't buy one with a really pronounced or curved to carpentry type of uh, tongs on it. What's the word? I'm, claws. Excuse me. Claws. that will hook down like this uh, because they're unhandy for prying. Those are intentionally made for pulling nails. You can still pull nails with these, but what you'll find is, is if you're ch you, you can use it to chip ice. You can use it for chipping out bricks and breaking stuff. You can use it for demo and you can still, it's flat enough where you can get it underneath things and use it as a prying tool. Uh, it's, it's just the all around hammer. That's the one you want. You want the S-Wing. Would I go the full 28 ounce framing size? This is a 24 ounce, I think. No, probably not. I think for the common guy, what I would do, and I don't have one, but the one I'm going to spec out will be a little bit shorter. It's going to be more of the all-arounder, but about the same weight, about a 22, 24 ounce weight. 24 ounce weight is nice, um, is what I would go with, more of a general purpose with the framing claws. That's what I would, that's what I would recommend. Okay, so that covers the hammer. If we could only have one, it's, uh, it's, it's the S-Wing. I think there's just no question about it. All right, do we have anything else in our bag of tricks? No, that's it. This is video three. We have two more to go and 20 more tools, and I'm still on the fence with a couple of them. So as I said, if you have things that I haven't covered so far that you think are just must-have, please put them in the comments because I'm reading through there, and that's helping me make those final decisions. So keep, keep putting those in there, and, and you have swayed me. Um, I think you have swayed me on some of my decisions. That, that I'll share with you in a future video. All right, if you want to see the first two, I'll link them to the end. Uh, the Amazon affiliate links to these tools and my suggestions are going to be in the subject heading and the pinned to the top comment. Uh, so you can look at that. So I guess that's it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next video.